the thing is, a lot of people don't know, like, that style of playing, you know, it does come from church. Um, D'Angelo was a big part of that, because D'Angelo was an organ, he's a church organist, you know, uh, back in Tennessee. Played at church, and I think he even directed the choir and stuff. You know, I have a friend that went to the church with him. You know, she was like, yeah, he's my choir director. I was like, what? That's crazy. And he plays like he sings, you know what I mean? And that style of playing kind of helped shape that neo-soul sound. That along with James Poyser on keys as well. And those are guys that you hear on all the Jay Dilla stuff. All those Jay Dilla songs, you know, Fantastic Volume 2 which was, is my favorite, you know. So, uh... Questlove uh, said uh, Jay Dilla was the key element. Okay, he, he is sadly gone. Maybe if you look back from today's perspective, then he said he is, is more important than in the time uh, Yeah, I'm about to say it. that, yeah. That But what was the special thing on Dilla? What was mm -hmm. he informed? Well, the thing about it is Dilla was a producer that changed the way musicians played their instruments. Most of the time a producer When you make beats, you copy what's there, or you you know you sample something and blah blah blah. But he had a way of even when he sampled, because a lot of times he played a lot of the instruments. He could play bass, he could play little keys, play little drums. His father was a jazz musician, you know what I mean. So that's where his sensibilities comes from, with the with 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 just the, the music and his drums and everything. Why it sounds like a drummer playing it a lot of times, because he has a sensibility because he listens to a lot of jazz and. That's the best sensibility there is, being a jazz drummer. You know what I mean? That's more sensibility than any other style of music, I think. Um, so Dilla, the way he made his beats, influenced the way people played their instruments because of just the unquantized vibe of it. You know what I mean? And just the way he laid it. No one, no one did that before. It didn't sound like that at all. You know what I mean? So that was a big influence, especially he was a big influence on Questlove. You know what I mean? Big influence on, on Erica Badu. On, on all that music, on all the neo soul stuff, I think he he started it <laughs> without purposely starting it. That's when I think that's when hip hop really infused with soul music. I think when they, when people say neo soul, that's what they mean. It's like basically like some real musical backpacker hip hop stuff mixed with soul music. So now it's like neo soul. It's like new soul. You know what I mean? It's like you know this is soul infused with hip hop. And the hip hop in, in in mind that they pretty much kind of draw to is is the you know the sound of Dilla when it comes to that stuff. So he's like a huge a huge part of that. And I was happy to actually when I look back on it, I'm like wow, I was there. I had common comments on my my next record, and I was in the studio with him last week week, and we were talking about that. Just uh, how we used to I used to give him piano lessons. He's a little street for me. I used to give him piano lessons, and we used to just go to the movies. It was just regular, you know what I mean. And a uh, little hang, go hang out at the studio with them, with you know, and stuff like that. It was just like, yo, that time period was so special because that was like, yeah, when Fantastic and Voodoo, and and um, uh, and uh, like Water for Chocolate and Bilal's first record, first point second came out, and all that stuff. You know, that's when Music Soul Child was coming out, and just everybody started Floor Tree. You know what I mean? That whole thing started that back then, and it was like, wow, this is really happening now. But I look back on it and I can appreciate it. Yeah. It's my favorite period of this uh, soul and hip hop uh, thing. Yeah. And I always thought, uh, why does it, uh, everybody thought in that time, that's the next big thing. Or, mm -hmm. And uh, it goes a little bit down and something like uh, guys like uh, Destiny's Child and uh, mm -hmm. Beyoncé took over. Okay, mm -hmm. you mentioned uh, Kanye West before, he had the spirit a little bit. So uh, could you explain what happened to Neo Soul? Uh, it's funny, I went to high school with, Nick, with Beyoncé. <laughs> Me and her went to high school, um, and my, my, my little cousin, uh, who Latoya, it was in Destiny's Child, so she went to my high school too. And it's funny, they they started getting a little buzz in Houston, and then all of a sudden, they did the like Super Bowl halftime with that. I think it was the No 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 song or something like that. But they never came back to school after that day. <laughs> They totally went off and just got tutors, and they were they were gone. Boom, they were they were on the road. They were off for the races. But um, well, I think what happened with Neo Soul maybe it was oversaturated. I think I think it got I think people got sick of it because 
no one took it and made it progress. Everybody kind of stayed in this certain sound. And then when you add the poetry with it, you know what I mean? People started doing the poetry with it, and then it just became a thing where you're like, oh, Jesus, you know, here we go. You know, I've heard that before. I've heard that before, heard that before. So I think too many people were copying it. And it never was extremely mainstream in the first place. It, 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 it wasn't selling like Destiny's Child. You know, it was always kind of an underground thing anyway. It was kind of like jazz. You know, I mean, it was the musicians' soul music. You know, the musicians' music and stuff. So, I, you know, I think it just got oversaturated with people doing the same exact thing. So people kind of did it and then left because it was like, you know what, everybody sounds like that. It's annoying. And the people who do that music are people who really love music. So I think people abandon it because it's like, they feel like, yo, I heard that before, I did it before, uh, you know, that kind of thing. I, I, I think that's what happened, you know. And then, like again, like I said, when it when it comes down to like you know, record labels folding and and people not being able to get their stuff out and blah 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 blah, yeah. that was one thing. I think it's starting to come back up now. Yeah, that's what I say because when I hear your new stuff with the experiment, this is the same feeling, but it's it's a new art, uh, a new way of uh, you you put it together. Uh, explain me uh, what's yeah. your philosophy of soul music today? Yeah, so, I mean, cause for me, when I think when I when we when we play, soul music is in there. It's, it's it's all the stuff that we grew up on. So, you know, most of the band we grew up in church. You know, I was playing in church when I was like twelve, and. So, and I was doing a lot of weddings playing R&B music <laughs> at the same time. So between the, well, my church upbringing and then playing R&B music, and my mother was a jazz singer and an R&B singer and, and a church singer, and she was the music director at the church and all that kind of stuff. So between my jazz, R&B, and, and gospel, that's kind of the, the, the main mix of me. And then when I moved to New York in 97, I got hit with the hip hop, like, first firsthand, you know. It's harder when you, it's it's better for me. I'm glad I moved to New York because that's the home of hip hop. And so I got to see so many things firsthand, not just listening to albums and CDs. I got to go to the Roots Jam Sessions. They used to have these jam sessions um, at the Five Spot, the spot called the Five Spot in Philly. That was around the time when the Yo was starting to stop, to pop off, you know what I mean? I would see, you know, Jill Scott there, Marsha Ambrosia, Jasmine Sullivan, you know, Bilal, all these people when they were not famous yet, you know, just going there and having jam session. And they used to do it every Tuesday. And me and Bilal were living in New York at this time, but we used to drive down there an hour and a half and drive to Philly to go. And then they started doing it in New York at this place called the Wetlands. And uh, funny, I was with Macy Gray last week. Also, she's on my record. And she, uh, we were, I was telling her that's where I first met her at Wetlands, because this is when she first started her career, just going to the jam session at Wetlands, you know, and then um, Common had her on his record, Like Water for Chocolate. She was on the original um, Ghetto Heaven song. There's another version with D'Angelo. That's great. Yeah, so it, it was just all that stuff. And so we got a chance to be there and feel that music. So with my music, it's an extension of that. It's like that, but mixed with having, you know, have being a jazz musician also, you know what I mean? So having the chops and the knowledge of a jazz musician, but also having the love for real, real soul music and hip hop at the same time and being able to play with all these great hip hop artists. So I got a chance to really, really play it. You know what I mean? So that's, that's I think that's what helps shape our music that we've all been able to be in those situations and play that music with the greatest people of that generation. I was, you know. Yeah, that's great. I think, again, I think it's Neil so taking to different levels, you know? Like I said, the problem with Neil Soul is that it kind of stayed the same. That same sound, was, it was the same. So people kind of got sick of it and kind of dropped off. But then it got picked back up with like people like myself, with my band, doing it in a way that stretches it and does something different. So I think a lot of people like Amy Winehouse and you know Adele and people like that, they take it and mix it with, like Adele, she mixes it with some pop kind of vibe and, made, and makes it work, you know what I mean? And she's dope. You know what I mean? Amy Winehouse was dope. You know, she took it but mixed it. Really, she had more of an old school, old school vibe with it. But it was still new sounding, yet old sounding, yet hip hop. You know, at the same time, and you know, so I think that 
that's kind of what helped it out, you know, just taking it and stretching it out a little bit and adding these, these other elements to it. I think it was good for music, you know what I mean? I think it was dope. Yeah. I think uh, the, uh, talking about the soul vibe uh, and this, uh, it's today you can find uh, soul in casting shows and hip hop and mainstream charts. Uh, the latest dance underground thing is is dealing with some soul musical aesthetics. What do you think? Why is this soul thing so important uh, for so many different uh, situations in the? I mean, I think soul music is probably the most popular music. The most popular beats like soul music. Even your most famous rock musicians, their favorite singers are soul singers. You know what I mean? Like, you know, anybody. You ask fucking David Lee Roth who his favorite singers are. You know, I bet you Marvin Gaye's in there. Or, you know what I mean? Or Curtis May, or somebody like that. You know, they all love soul singers and soul music. You know what I mean? And I think it's just a big, important chunk of the music world. It's a big, important chunk of it. And it helps shape shape the music world. I think a lot of times, you know, soul music also, you know, it was a music that talked about, it was the hip hop of its day because it actually talked about, you know, issues that were going on in certain time periods and you can hear it in the music. You yeah. know what I mean? When you listen to like Isley Brothers or you listen to Marvin Gaye and what's going on or something like that or, you know, uh, uh, Mercy, mercy, me. Or, yeah, what, what about what do you think about the civil rights movement? How was it a reflect uh, in soul music in yeah, that, that days? That's what I'm saying. That's that's exactly what I'm saying. You know, the soul uh, with the civil rights mo movement. Uh, with, with with that also, a lot of that was uh, you can check out a lot of soul records and you can hear that. You can hear the stories of that, or they're talking about that because they're being conscious and talking about what's happening at that time. I think that's what made it so soulful because they were going through it at the time. You know, the same way jazz is soulful as well, and a lot of jazz musicians were going through that stuff at the same time, but instrumentalists just play instruments. So they're, they're you know, getting their aggression out and telling their story through instruments, but it's not as obvious as, you know, Marvin Gaye being able to say, what's going on? There are far too many of you dying. Mother, mother, you know, the, he can say it and you can hear it. You can understand it quicker. A jazz musician, John Coltrane playing Alabama, you're not gonna, if you don't know what the song's about, you'll be like, oh, it's touching, but you don't know he's talking about the four little girls that got bombed at the, in, in the church. You know what I mean? Or something like that. So it's, it's, uh. So it's more abstract, what you mean? And this soul thing is more a uh, hard more It's more obvious yeah. with soul music. Yeah, so, so, like, yeah, like I was saying, so, like, you know, there's a, um, there's a uh, Abby Lincoln and Max Roach album they did together. That that has it's it's a reflection of that whole period, you know, and about of the the civil rights movement, and you know Max is playing and Abby's yelling and you know just giving just giving her soul out to it because you're crying about that kind of stuff, you know what I mean? And some of that is not as obvious, like I said, as you know hearing you know the Isley Brothers speak on it or Earth Wind and Fire speak on it or or you know Aretha Franklin, you know. I had uh, one thing when I uh, uh, read your album, the t title Black Radio, I thought my partner was uh, focused uh, on this uh, early stuff uh, in soul music, R&B, the 40s. And how important was uh, radio for basic acceptance of African-American music in the USA in the beginning days of soul and R&B? Um, I think it was very important. You know, I think... Um You know, we wrote a lot of songs. You know, African Americans wrote a whole lot of music that we didn't get credit for. You know, a lot of times they would get a white person to sing it. You know what I mean? Uh, to make it popular <laughs> because they didn't want black people on the radio. You know what I mean? But once we were able to infiltrate the radio, you know, you got people like Chuck Berry doing his thing, and but people, you know, even even that, you know, Beach Boy stealing his shit. You know. Uh, That happened so much in the in the music world back then, um, but I think it was it, it was extremely important because it just gets the message out there and it gets it spreads quicker. I mean, radio is, is such a huge, huge, huge machine that can make or break you. You know what I mean? It gets you it gets you across the world. Everybody hears it. 
get you across the world. It's it's what for musicians it, it it's what can you know put you on the A list or this or the D list actually. <laughs> you know what I mean? You could be you could be a nobody and have a song on the radio and you're instantly a star. You could be in the music business for thirty years and never have anything on the radio mm -hmm. and you're treated as if you're a D list. You know what I mean? Like totally. And and uh, so you know my 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 purpose of black radio was it was a double-edged sword it was like talking about yeah this is what i think it should be because this is real music from the soul and it's artistic and that's what we are we are artistic people and i think it's okay to have something like this play because you don't music has been dumbed down so much and the shit they play on the radio is so horrible now it's like they've brainwashed yeah. You can't uh, hear good uh, soul music on radio today, no. I think. Uh, what's no. the reason for that? It's only old. If you hear soul music, it's old soul music. It's like from the from it's, it's from the fifties or something. You know what I mean? And that's that's just how they programmed it. I don't know, you know, I don't necessarily know why. There's some conspiracies out there, <laughs> but it's like I think people think I think a lot of people say they want to only have us have black people in a certain light, in a certain way, like. Black people couldn't be artsy like Amy Winehouse could and make it as big as she could, even though there's a million Amy Winehouses in the black community. But when she says she's white and she does it, it's like, oh, you know what I mean? That's different. Let's do that. But it's like, I know a million black women that sing like that, that sing better than that, that could do the same thing, give, give them the right producer. Same yeah. shit, you know what I mean? What about Adele? Like, uh, Same thing. Uh, think about it, uh, she was black, uh, she was a very uh, big person, exactly. no black uh, no. in the media in this you way. You go to any Baptist church in the USA and find a, a 20 Adele's, you know what I mean, 30 Adele's, and they will never get the same, the same, you know, the same look. They, they just wouldn't, they wouldn't get the same exposure, they wouldn't be as famous. It's just the fact that when somebody white does something that black people created, they get a lot more credit and they go further. That's just how it's been for a very, very, very long time. You know what I mean? And that's kind of how it is. It's just, it sucks. <laughs> you know what I mean? And the, the, but that, that's kind of how they, the system has made it in a way. So, you know, breaking out of that is hard. It's very hard. And so you just got to do what you do and, you know, I do my version of what radio should be, <laughs> and that's what it is. <laughs> uh, coming back to these historical uh, themes, uh, uh, do you know a record companies uh, brought African American music? Uh, what was the marketing concept behind this race music thinking, and how did it develop uh, in a new category named R&B in the 40s? Uh, do you know something about this? Um, I, I, I don't know a lot about it, but yeah, I mean, that makes sense, race music. I mean, that makes sense because at that point, you know, a lot of our famous musicians and singers were playing at these shows full, a lot of people come into the show, but they had to go to the back door at the end. They couldn't even use the same bathroom. You know what I mean? They, like all these things, they were, the, they were the star. That's like me being right now at the show, not being able to go to the bar or eat the same food these people are eating or anything. You know what I mean? They have to go to the back and they treat you like shit, but they're, they use your art because they love the art, but they're treating you like shit. And it hasn't, like I said before, that that mentality still is there. You know what I mean? Except they've tricked the people. They they've played the certain things on radio, so that makes it makes our younger generation pretty. They stuff that down your throat, the bad music down your throat. So now the white people don't look as bad. It's like, oh, it's not us. This is what y'all like. You know what I mean? But it's like you won't let anything else on the radio. You know, you won't let it on the radio at all. So I, I, I you know. It's, it's it's that same mentality that hasn't that hasn't that hasn't really changed. You know, they they wanted they wanted to be out there, but it's like you're still a nigger <laughs> yeah. in a way, and that's that's real. You know, and, un, and unfortunate. You know, I think European radio is so much cooler. Okay. <laughs> I'd rather listen to the radio out here, <laughs> listen to the radio in New York. Honestly, really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. You have a better appreciation for everything because you don't have all the bullshit. You don't have the Americanized bullshit uh, that history that. What we do you think? Yeah, where does it come from? Because a lot of times I think uh, in in Europe there's more love to the soul music which yeah. came from African Americans than in the U.S. and jazz, same thing. Yeah, why? But because the civil rights movement and all that was American, so we have all of our American problems, and and you know, and everybody's everybody's family, everybody's history is 
there's blood there. There's blood stains there in America. So that's what we're paying for. So y'all don't have that against us. So when you come over here for y'all, it's like, hey, everything's everything. We love music. Let's play that. You know what I mean? It's great. We don't have Giles Petersons <laughs> and, and Benji B's and the, these kind of people in America. You know, that's why a lot of people tune into their, their stations. It is for European guys like me, it's sometimes uh, difficult to understand because we look up to that music in the US. Yeah. And then uh, the guys come back and said, uh, yeah. But you got the special, uh, it's a little bit orthodox. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, very strange. Fine. Okay, one uh, last uh, historical thing. Uh, what do you think, uh, in which way did gospel music influence the birth of the genre soul music? I think gospel music influenced the birth of the soul music because pretty much every soul singer came from church. Every, all of them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Especially the, I mean, everybody came. Most, most people came from church. The black the black experience, you know, the, the, a majority of every black person experience has something to do with church, being in church. And that's a lot of our best, our, our, um, a, a lot of our uh, artists and, and musicians grew up singing and playing in church. That's where African Americans learn how to play. You can, that, that's where you can play at an early age and sing somewhere at an early age in front of an audience as well. You know what I mean? So you're Whitney Houston's and you're, you know, you have that era. And then you have your Aretha Franklin's who was doing the same thing, you know, and, and your Shaka Khan's and all these people, you know. She wasn't necessarily a church girl. Shaka was actually Catholic. But, <laughs> but you know, you have people like that that grew up singing in church. And I think... And you mentioned D'Angelo and other guys that... Yeah, uh, D'Angelo. It's the same day today. So. D'Angelo, Bilal, you know, they're, they're all, all these people are church people. You know, um, and and so you know your Angie Stones and all that all that stuff. Um, so I think it's church. Once people stop singing gospel music and they want to go more mainstream, it's like the gospel music of mainstream. You know what I mean? Because you still hear that same passion and that same spirit, but except you're talking about making love versus talking about Jesus. <laughs> so it's a direct thing like psh, psh, psh. even the instruments even the sound of the recordings back then and soul music sounded like church church you know a lot of it was organ piano bass drums you know what i mean and and vocals and that's exactly what was at church you know the same kind of setup the same sound if you listen to church recordings and then you listen to early soul records it's the same sound you know what i mean so i think also musically the church influenced that the soul music as well, not not just not just with the singers, but just musically and sonically, because that's what we were used to hearing. So we took that because that's what we're used to. We took that sound and was like, oh, let's do this music. But that church music is so influential, so it literally sounds the same. <laughs> you know, when you check out any gospel album from 1940 and then check out check out an early Aretha album or something like that, it's damn near the same. Or a Sam Cooke record or any of those records. You know, like. But Bobby Womack, whatever, it's all it's all there. You know what I mean? That sound is all there. So that's cool. So um, you're talking uh, earlier about this uh, racial boundaries in the music business. Uh, thinking about the '60s when Motown productions blew up, they were the first uh, they, who uh, crossed this racial boundaries. What do you think were the, were the reason from the musical side for that? Uh, um. For the musical side, I think, well, when was that? That was like late 60s or something? Yeah, early 60s. Early 60s, late, yeah. something in there. Um, Very gaudy. I think a big chunk of it was Michael Jackson. You know, I think a big chunk of it was obviously Barry Gordy. But I think a big, huge chunk of it was... Yeah, if you think about the, the Supremes, maybe, the early, in the early 60s or mid 60s, they were popular here in Europe too. Huh? And mm -hmm. they, they were a band who crossed the boundaries completely. Uh, mm -hmm. what do you I think people gave up. With, <laughs> I think a lot of times people just gave up. It was like, damn it, they're black, but it's good. <laughs> at a certain point, they just got to just give it up at some point. You know, it's like, okay, we can't hold on to this shit any longer. It's fucking cool, and we need people to hear it. You know, and the, the, that was the vibe. It's like, we need, we need to go ahead and let everybody hear it, let it blow up, so, you know, then we can learn it, basically. You know what I mean? In, yeah. in, in a way, that, that's, that, that's kind of the vibe. 
Maybe it's not a, a thing about thinking, but a feeling thing. You you have to go moving and exactly. dancing. Exactly. The yeah. truth is the truth, and the honesty will. The truth always rises to the top at some point. Yeah. You know, it totally does. And so I think at, the, at a certain point, it just did, and that's just what it. It just what it was. But again, they still have a cap on it because they don't let. There's not, you know, even in the industry, you you look at how many white artists come out that are big, huge rock bands, all these things. That's. How come there are no black bands? Huge. There are none. No, every, all these white bands that come, they're sweeping the Grammys every year, different different bands that you never heard of, but they're huge. You know, it's like, oh my God, they're big. But there's never any black bands like that, you know, and there's never any, a lot of new African-American artists that come out all the time that are huge. The only, the only artists they allow for that to be huge are like Southern rap, some rap, rap stuff that's like not good. You know, my bitches and my hoes and my yeah. duh, 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 duh. Those are the songs that make it big. If a great art African American soul singer comes out, he's not gonna get you're not gonna hear about him. Bilal is the best example. I think he's the most brilliant singer. I he's can... my favorite singer of all yeah. time. And I've lived with the brother for you know, he, I'm I'm the god I'm the godson of his his children, you know what I mean? Like we lived together for like three or four four years, you know what I mean? And I've heard him sing sing stuff that you would probably never hear him sing in public. You know, he can do anything he wants. He's so talented. You know, he's a brilliant mind and he's he's so beyond singing. It's a, he's almost like it's like an actor. He just plays the part of the song so he can portray the song. A lot of singers just sing, "Hey, look at me, I can sing," but you don't feel it and they're not relaying the song or the message. And Bilal is always about relaying the message. He'll he'll compromise singing to relay the message. The same way we compromise, when I play hip hop stuff, I'm not chopping out all the time. You can play, you can hear th hear me play three or four songs, four or five songs, five, six songs tonight, and you would know that I have these chops that I have because I'm playing the music, I'm playing what's needed for that moment, and that's how you reach people. Other than that, you're playing, you're masturbating musically. You know what I mean? And it does nothing for the other person. Yeah. If I masturbate, it does something for me. It's an ego not trip. For, right? Not for y'all. <laughs> you know what I mean? I but see. musical masturbation is a horrible thing. And Bilal does not do that. He totally is about the moment. And I love singers like that. Yeah. I and met him before two years here. He was great. He was so often. Yeah. I did a song with him on his last, his, his latest record. Um, I heard that. It's great. This, yeah. uh, is it this uh, butterfly, butterfly thing? Yeah. 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 And that was kind of off the cuff and kind of put together, like last minute kind of thing. And so, and those are the kind of artists I like to work with. That's why Black Radio, that's what I have on my album. Those kind of artists who, artists who don't sound like anybody else, they are real honest and they sound like themselves. And, and they're very of the moment artists. And that's what I love, you know, mm. so. So, uh, that's one of my favorite albums. Is that Midnight Marauders? Yeah. The t-shirt? Top five. It's for you. It's my heart, yeah. It's top five. Yeah. <laughs> I like it very much. When and with what song would you define the beginning of funk music? Uh, wow. I think it's, it must be a James Brown thing. Uh, I don't know. What do you think? Well, see, that thing... Um, you could even go back before James Brown. You can go... You can go... You could even go, like, Fela. You know what I mean? A lot of that stuff is funk too. A lot of that stuff sounds like James Brown shit. You know what I mean? Um, it's the same with the guitar riffs. You know, any the guitar riffs and just the pocket being there and all that stuff. But I, 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 you know, I would say James Brown took it there to the point where it was like, that's why he's a godfather. That's why, because of that. So I, I, I would agree. Mm -hmm. I would agree. I would agree that James Brown's also the reason, a lot of the reason for hip hop too. You know what I mean? He had, James Brown was so dope because he had a lot of elements in his music that other cats didn't have because he understood jazz music and he understood funk music and he fused them together to make a certain sound. A lot of his drummers were jazz drummers. When you, and sometimes he would use the two at the same time. You know, James Brown would use a jazz drummer and a funk drummer. And you can Double see stocks it. And Yeah, and you can you can see it when you see some of his shows. You see one dude playing, and he's playing with the with the, with that grip. I forget what you call it. I'm not a drummer, 
but he's playing, he's totally playing, he's a jazz drummer, he's totally playing in a jazz way. And then you have another drummer who's playing with snare like that, over there. So it's two different vibes. And a lot of the time the jazz drummer has certain sensibilities that just most drummers don't have, just because the music you're playing, the way you have to play it. So it's like a light, very fluffy funk. Is that the you know, feeling that the hip hop guys are exactly. in the early days uh, uh, exactly. try to? Exactly. And now that whole feeling has gone away. The feeling of the snare and ghost notes and that whole thing, you know what I mean? It's gone. It's all about, you know, <laughs> knocking you in the head with it, which sometimes is good too. But I think that's what that's where it got lost. I think that's where Dilla was great at. Yeah. Premier is great at that. P Rock's great at that. You know what I mean? But I think that that kind of production is kind of lost um, and that's where that, that feeling you know just those notes you don't hear you just feel them you don't hear them <laughs> you know what I mean it's like Ooh. you know it's a different thing it's not so mechanical sounds you know what sound is that I don't even sound like a drum but they just use it <laughs> you know yeah okay man last question is uh, in which way is Stevie Wonder an admirable for musicians I read that you did the show uh, with Questlove uh, for Steve Wonder and the music. Yeah, I'm doing one tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> In yeah. Philadelphia. We fly to Philadelphia to do another one. So explain a little bit, uh, Stevie, what, what kind of musician is. Uh, Philadelphia, I mean, Stevie Wonder, musically, for me, is probably the, is the highest level you can get for musically for anybody. The re reason I'm saying that because I don't think anybody that creates the music, only other person like this I'm about to mention is like Michael Jackson, but he didn't create the music. He was just that kind of icon that everybody knew and everybody loved. But Stevie created all his music. And I don't think not one person has crossed every genre of people with that music. Everybody loves Stevie. You know what I'm saying? You can go any country musician, any rock musician, any church musician, R&B, hip hop, whatever it is, everybody loves Stevie, some error of Stevie, you know what I mean? And that's the other thing too, he has all these different errors and you can watch him grow musically and it's amazing, you know what I mean? And again, he's a person that loves jazz music as well, so you hear all that. He, he's the first person to really um, make musicality extremely cool. Regular people sing his songs and they don't really know how deep the harmony, what's really going on, how deep that shit is and how dope it is. He's, he's, he was able to slide that in without it having to be simple all the time. You know what I mean? It, he made it okay to be musically, you know, complex, but he made it accessible. And that's, that's what I aim to do, you know, and make, make music that's intellectual but at the same time, accessible to everyone. I don't want to feel like I have to make something and dumb it down and make it very, very simple for you to understand it. I want to give you something that's makes that's that's that will heighten your knowledge. Or do you, you know think that's the same philosophy that Stevie? Uh, had? I think so, but I, I don't even think he thinks about it. You know what I mean? I think he that's just what he heard, and that's what he liked, and that's you know. So I think I think he didn't think about it. He did it without thinking about it. I think you know what I mean. It's so natural, and this stuff is just so layered with so many sounds and, and so much harmony going on under that, but people are just singing it. And the melodies are so singable. And that's another thing he was very clever with. You know, he's like, oh, you know, make all the... He probably did think about it sometimes. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this under it, but I'm going to make this thing so singable that the regular people aren't going to realize it. So I'm, I'm making the musicians happy, and I'm making the regular people happy. You know, and that's... He's the epitome of that. No other artist has ever done that on the level that he has done it, period. No other artist that makes the music, you know what I mean? And so, like, again, that's, he's one of my idols when it comes to that. I strive to do, to do that. That's, that's, that's amazing, you know, to, because most people who are, who are musicians and who have a lot of knowledge musically, you know, a lot of times they appease the other musicians, you know, and the other people don't get them because they're too high, they're too, And those, those kind of people don't even realize, they don't understand regular stuff or understand regular melodies. Stevie did, but he knew both. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? He was a master at that. I think it's great art to can realize both because exactly. yeah, exactly. This you know, yeah, totally. Okay, one last thing. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I he said all, that like 19 on. times. <laughs> <laughs> That's my strategy. <laughs> But uh, one thing I would like to know is, uh, we talk about this uh, civil right thing and uh, song using in that day is reflected very much. Uh, in 2009, Obama becomes the first uh, president. Yep. Do you see there any connection with song music or, ex or expression? Yeah, or totally. I think it was. Explain it. I think it was dope that it almost reminded me of when like. Martin Luther King would speak, you know, when I see, when I saw him do the inauguration, when I saw him speaking, um, you know, because when Martin Luther King would speak, all these musicians would be around, you know, John Coltrane used to go hear him speak, Miles Davis used to hear him speak, you know, um, and, and uh, soul singers, all, all kinds of soul singers used to go there, you can look on any picture and just, See Muhammad Ali. See all these people championing somebody that's the forefront of a movement, and Obama is that person who's the forefront of a movement. You know what I mean? And it was great to see people like a Jay Z and and like Aretha Franklin. You know what I mean? And um, people Herbie. You know what I mean? And these are people who were there during during the civil rights movement. And you know, so it was amazing to see that, and it just it it obviously it brought tears to my eyes. I was crying like a baby just to see that because you see the older people who were there, and then you see like your Beyonces, and you know, and and whatever all these all the younger artists who who will come up because of these older artists, you know, without or Beyonce, without Aretha Franklin, there would be no Beyonce, those kind of things because Aretha str struggled, you know what I mean, to get where. So Beyonce can do what she does. Herbie struggled and opened doors so I can do what I'm doing. You know what I mean? And it was amazing. So Martin Luther King struggled for Barack to do what he's doing. You know what I mean? So you just see that. And it, it was absolutely amazing to see. And uh, and I think, yeah, I think it all comes from the, and Barack loves music too. You know what I mean? A lot of, a lot of times the messages you get are from the music, you know? It's, strict, it's, it's pretty much from the, from, from the music, and music is very powerful. That's a great statement, man.